be blessed to live in a free country. Sometimes I just forget, thank God, for the freedom that we have. And um, our, the word of God for us today is from John chapter 8. Verses uh, 31-36. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves to anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks. Would you pray with me? The Lord, open our ears and our hearts. Let us hear what we need to hear and show us what we need to do to become more faithful disciples of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. I have seen a lot of fireworks displays in my lifetime. One of my earliest memories of fireworks is sitting on top of the fire truck at Fort Lee, where uh, my uncle was a firefighter. Don't worry, they're only a block away from the fireworks, and so they could still get there quickly if they needed to. And they would throw me off uh, if they had to, to run. I remember uh, going with my church youth group to uh, the Richmond Braves, they were then, uh, before they were the Flying Squirrels, uh, to, to the July 4th uh, game and watching the fireworks at the end of the ball game, an all-American uh, night of, um, of fellowship together. And then uh, I remember as I got older, uh, but still at home, and uh, the nights that um, uh, my parents and I were really too tired to go out and be in crowds, and so we would watch uh, none other than the Boston Pops uh, on TV uh, with the big fireworks display at the end of that as well. One of the most memorable that I will always remember, fireworks displays uh, that I've witnessed, uh, happened in Blacksburg. That place close to God's heart. <laughs> in the summer of 2002, Blacksburg in the summer is always special. Uh, and uh, the show, the fireworks show, seemed especially good that year. Maybe that's because it was the first 4th of July after 9-11, 2001. I felt the swell of pride in our country, in our military. The swell of pride was hard to express. It was hard because I was headed into my senior year at Virginia Tech. By that time, I knew that I was going to seminary after college, that I was going into pastoral ministry, and I had been taking New Testament classes as part of my religion minor uh, at Tech. And it was the first time that I began really digging into the Gospels. It was the first time that I began really noticing the dissonance between the one whom we follow as the Prince of Peace and the prevailing mindset that was capturing our national consciousness best expressed and the famous song of Toby Keith at the time. Justice will be served and the battle will rage. This big dog will fight when you rattle his cage. And you'll be sorry that you messed with the U.S. of A. Because we'll put a boot in your behind. <laughs> it's the American way. It's a dissonance I still struggle with today as a pastor, 
as one who earnestly seeks to, to follow Jesus Christ as an American citizen. And so we wrestle with this question today. What is true freedom? What does it look like? Where does it come from? Does true freedom come from a Bill of Rights? A Declaration of Independence? Indeed, we should and we do give thanks for the grace of living in a land that allows us the freedom to worship or not as we choose. We follow Paul's advice and we pray for wisdom for our leaders, be they Republican or Democrat. I just wish that we would pray for peace as earnestly and with as much zeal as we pray for protection for our men and women who defend our country. I saw a great church sign that said, the more we sweat for peace, the less we will bleed in war. I hope we would stop and consider, just think, how quickly some folks equate Christianity and unquestioned patriotism, and vice versa, because they're not equal. At least consider it simply historically. We are still a 241-year-old experiment in government. And one day, that experiment will come to an end. But the Church of Jesus Christ has existed for 2,000 years and more. And when we've been there 10,000 years, we will have no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. The only kingdom that will exist forever is the church and the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a song we're singing in the sanctuary this morning. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. And the last line says, kings and kingdoms, will all pass away but there's something about that name Jesus you see where all of this leads us as I see it is to a prevailing mindset today that so many people seem to think that just because we live in America that makes them Christian makes us followers of Jesus just because of our earthly citizenship and the inverse so often seems to be true as well. I can see people squirming that if we don't fully express our patriotism, we're somehow less Christian, if even at all. My concern is that if we think this way, it's a dangerous, slippery slope into insisting our right to live as we choose to live not as God would have us to live. It's a slippery slope to declare our independence not just against tyranny, but from the King of Kings and Lord of Lords Himself. These same dynamics were playing out in Jesus' day. No, the Bible doesn't say anything about the United States of America. Some people would be surprised to hear that. But the Pharisees, the Jewish leadership of the day, they clung to their traditions, to their heritage, to their ancestry. They celebrated it. It was a great source of pride to be able to trace your lineage back to one of the original 12 tribes of Israel. Rabbis would boast that all Israelites are sons of kings, referring to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. They were, after all, the chosen people of God set apart to God. And by the time of Jesus, they were set apart all right to themselves. 
They hated their Samaritan neighbors to the north. They naturally despised their Roman occupiers and anyone who colluded with them like the tax collectors. They boasted that they were children of Abraham, but they forgot the part that they were blessed in order to be a blessing to all the nations around them. And along comes Jesus. And at this point in John's Gospel, there's a dispute going on of the identity of Jesus, who His Father is, the validity of His claims. And in typical fashion, Jesus turns the tables on those who are questioning His identity back on them. To the Jews who believed Him, Jesus said, if you hold to My teaching, you are really My disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered Him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Abraham's descendants have never been slaves of anyone? What's that second book in the Bible called? It's Exodus from what? Where they were slaves? Where? In Egypt? You see, part of the problem when we get so wrapped up in the parts of our history that we want to make great again is that we ignore the parts in which we have failed <coughs> miserably and been delivered through them only by the grace of God. Even as they're speaking in our text for today, they're speaking under the watchful eye of their Roman occupiers against whom their rebellions for freedom had already failed time and time again. But I hope we realize that Jesus is speaking about more than national freedom. Speaking about more than individual liberty. N.T. Wright in his commentary, John for Everyone, says it this way, there is a worse slavery than that which they had suffered in Egypt or the semi-slavery they were suffering under the rule of Rome. It is the slavery that grips not only individuals, but also groups, nations, and families of nations. It is the slavery we know as sin. And the Greek word here for sin, hamartia, it, it means more than simply offenses against God or against one another. It means to miss the mark, as in archery, where you aim as best as you can for the bullseye, but for whatever reason the arrow drifts off to the edges of the target. Sometimes you miss it entirely. To modernize this analogy, we might think of it, and it's fresh in my mind because I just had to have this done to my truck along with a bunch of other really expensive things. And I had to have a front end line. You can experiment. If you're going down the road and you've got a straight stretch of road in front of you, just let, let your hands off the wheel a little bit. Just let the steering wheel go where it, where, where it will just a little bit. And if, it, if you're going straight and you start drifting this way, or you start drifting that way, guess what? You need a front end alignment. It's the same with our hearts and our souls as well. If our hearts start drifting this way, our lives start drifting that way from the straight and narrow that God would have us walk, we need a front end alignment of the heart. But how far will we drift? How far will we drift as individuals, as a church, especially as a nation? before we realize that we have gotten so far off course. How long will we be happy to simply hit the target? I didn't get the bullseye, but at least I hit it today. Or I got it somewhere close in the vicinity over there where the target is. As they say, close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. How often are we happy to simply get it close and to really aim for the bullseye of living holy as our Father in heaven is holy. The living in the likeness of Jesus Christ himself. Jesus says, as long as we miss the mark, 
As long as we miss the mark, we sin. And the more that we sin, the more the alignment gets worse. And we become slaves and bondage to the ways of this world. But friends, it doesn't have to be this way. Freedom is what the gospel promises. But it's not a freedom to escape this world and the life hereafter. It's a freedom to live in, but not of the world here and now. This is not freedom that we can earn. It's not freedom that we can fight for. It's not freedom that we can give to others. Jesus says if we sin, we're slaves to sin, and the slave has no permanent place in the family. But a son belongs to it forever. And so if the son has set you free, you're, you are free. Free to aim for the bullseye and live in the likeness of our Lord Jesus Christ. Free to live in the blueprint as Jesus laid out in the Beatitudes. Free to seek justice, but love mercy. Free to beat our swords into plowshares and our spears into pruning hooks and not to learn war anymore. Free to go into the, all the world, not to make them democracies or American outposts, but to make disciples of Jesus Christ teaching and baptizing them in the freedom of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You see, brothers and sisters, don't get me wrong, I am proud to be an American. But where I know I am truly free is at the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the foot of the cross where His body was broken. His blood was shed for us. Seek first the kingdom, Jesus says. And all these other things will fall into place. Paul says, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there. The Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, all I'm asking is that this Independence Day, and every day in which we live in the freedom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's keep the main thing the main thing. We give thanks that we live in the land of the free and the home of the brave. But especially in the church, we celebrate, praise, and honor our great God who gives us freedom from sin through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. God, you created this world. Filled with so many different people. They're all a reflection. We are all a reflection of your image in which you created us. You created us in love. But our love has failed you time and time again. It's failed each other. Unite us as one again, O oh Lord. Unite us as one, not just in the cause of liberty as a nation, but unite us as one in your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who came 
to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, healing of the sick, freedom for the oppressed, liberation for the prisoners. Help us to continue his work here in our country, in our world. Pour out your spirit upon us to live boldly for you first and foremost. To seek first your kingdom. And to pray earnestly for this country that needs all the prayer it can get. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us gathered here and upon these gifts of bread and juice. Let them be for us the body and blood of Christ. That we may be for the world the body and blood of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit make us one with Christ. One with each other and one in ministry to all the world. Until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly bed. Through your son Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit all honor and glory is yours almighty Father. These things we pray in the precious name of our Lord Jesus, as he taught us to pray, say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.